Today is our guest, the prominent world-class economist, author of the Economist bestseller, Capital in the 21st Century, French professor Thomas Piketty. Uh, Mr. Piketty allowed us to introduce ourselves. My name is Jana Bobosikova. I am journalist and former member of the European Parliament. This is my colleague, Hanna Lipovska, economics analyst and lecturer at the Prague University of Finance and Administration. Uh, Mr. Professor, this year the Harvard University Press published your latest book, The Brief History of Equality. Could you define, please, what do you, in your work, mean as equality? This is a very broad notion, you know, including political equality, uh, social, economic equality. And to, to, make, to make it clear, let, let me say that, you know, so this book is uh, um, much shorter than my previous books, where the, uh, which were like 1,000 pages long. This one is, uh, is only 250 pages long. And, you know, I have tried to... I have tried to focus on what I see in the end as the most important uh, lesson from my research on the you know, history of equality and inequality. And the, the most important conclusion is the idea that you know, in the long run, we do have a movement toward more equality, which begins... Uh, you know, it's not been there forever. You know, it's not since uh, Neolithic times. You know, it started... It's grounded in history. It started, say, at the end of the 18th century, with the French Revolution, the US Revolution to some extent. Uh, this starts with the uh, abolition of the privileges of the aristocracy, and then, which marks uh, the beginning of the end of status-based inequality and uh, uh, equality of rights. Uh, this, this also starts with the slave revolt in Saint-Domingue in 1791, which is sort of the beginning of the end of colonial slave societies, colonial societies. Now, what you can see with these two examples is that, you know, this is a very broad notion of equality. So, you know, it includes basic rights, political rights together with economic and social rights. What you can see also is that this is a process that has been going on, you know, over the following two centuries. So, you know, in the 19th century, you have the final abolition of slavery, you, you have the rise of the labor movement, the rise of uh, universal suffrage, first for men in the 19th century and for women in the 20th century, decolonization in the 20th century, rise of labor movement, social security, progressive taxation, uh, decolonization, civil rights in the US, uh, end of apartheid in the late uh, 20th century. And this is a process you know, which continues today with, uh, with the Me Too movement, the, the Black Lives Matter movement. And you, know, you can see that you know, the, the, we still have today, you know, we live in more equal societies, of course, than, you know, at the, at the end of the 18th century. But, you know, we still live uh, in societies where, you know, the power of money is very important, for instance, in our democracy. So, you know, we, we are not, you know, we don't have aristocratic privileges anymore, but there are other privileges. And, you know, the um, a, a billionaire, you know, can influence uh, elections, can influence media, you know, have more political voice, more political influence in a way that, you know, it's different from the, Ancien regime or from the property based democracy of the 19th century, but it's still, you know, very imperfect. And I think when, when people 50 years from now or 100 years from now will look at our democratic system today, uh, you know, maybe they will say, uh, well, okay, you know, it's democracy, but, you know, it's sort of intermediate between the 19th century democracy and more real democracy, which hopefully will be in place in 50 years or 100 years. And this is the same for international inequality. You know, we've made progress, you know, as compared to the time of slavery and colonialism, but, you know, we still have enormous uh, inequality between the North and the South. We still have enormous racial discrimination uh, uh, within a uh, country. So this is a kind of long run movement toward more equality that I'm talking about. So this is a very broad, multidimensional notion of equality. And this is, you know, an ever going process that, that is primarily based on political uh, transformation, political mobilization, social struggles. And uh, uh, this is going to continue. You've mentioned the two historical breakup processes, both revolutions, the French one and the Russian, and you've Black Lives Matter movement, Me Too movement, and so on. 
But how do you consider nowadays crucial events? There's the coronavirus crisis on the one hand and the Russian-Ukraine war, war on the other hand. So what can be expected impact on the equality or inequality in the world, or at least in the European continent? Yeah, you know, these two events, you know, the COVID and the Ukraine war, unfortunately, are not, uh, I mean, they are not eman emancipation movement to begin with. You know, they are mm -hmm. catastrophe of a different nature, of course, but to begin with. So, you know, the COVID is just a pure catastrophe. So, of course, we can learn from catastrophe to improve our health system, etc. But to, uh, to begin with, this is just, just bad. Uh, this is purely bad. So we don't need, you know, I don't believe in those stories that we need catastrophes to, <laughs> to make progress. You know, catastrophes are not necessary and, and they are not sufficient because they can also lead to, to very bad uh, political outcomes, to the rise of nationalism. But with Ukraine, you know, it's a different uh, and much more complex story, uh, you know, which has, to, which has some resemblance with, uh, with many uh, patterns of nationalism uh, in the past, unfortunately, and with, uh, you know, the fact that a very uh, powerful uh, state capacity, state power, you know, can be used uh, for the better or the worst. And, you know, that's also one of the lessons from my uh, history of equality, that state power and state centralization, you know, is not it's not good or bad in itself. You know, it depends, you know, who controls the state and for what political project. And, uh, 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 you know, in, in, I, in my book, I tell the story of Sweden, you know, where, which we view today as sort of a very egalitarian country with a state capacity that is used to have a progressive uh, taxation of income and wealth to pay for a good welfare state system. But for a long time, the state capacity of Sweden was used, uh, uh, well, not to invade Ukraine, but was used, you know, to protect extreme inequality uh, with, uh, you know, a system of voting rights, uh, you know, until uh, 1910, where, you know, rich people, well, rich men, you know, would have between one and 100 votes, depending on how wealthy they are. And even in municipal elections, uh, there was no upper limit, so you had several dozen Swedish municipalities where, uh, uh, you know, only one individual had a majority of the vote. And, and you know, this was Sweden until 1910, and, and, and even multinationals today, you know, wouldn't dare asking for such a system. I mean, they would love to have a system like this in the countries in the global south or global north where they operate, but they don't even dare asking for this kind of voting right. Sometimes they find other ways to get the same outcome, but the very fact that they don't even dare asking for that is interesting. Now, this was Sweden until 1910, and then you had big, uh, you know, trade union mobilization, uh, Social Democratic Party victory uh, uh, in 1932, which sort of put the state capacity of Sweden and its administration and its register to measure income and wealth to the service of a completely different project where you would register income and wealth not to distribute more political power but to make these people pay for for a system of health care and education that is uh, you know that that is not perfect and we've seen with covid the limitation of our health care system but still it was much better than everything else that had been done at that time so i'm, I'm saying this because you know today you know the, the way the russian state is using its state capacity is is of course you know the the sort of the worst worst example you can you can you can think and you know we we you know viewed from Western Europe you know we 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 think of the wars uh, the wars uh, you know between France and and Germany World War One World War Two about you know the, the frontier between France and Germany which caused the uh, you know, two world wars and three big wars between France and Germany in 1870 and World War II, except that here, you know, of course, um, you know, Russia is uh, three times uh, more populated than Ukraine. So, you know, the, the, it is just brute force, uh, uh, you know, trying to, to, to find a, to find a future for, for, you know, completely irrational and, uh, and, uh, you know, insane view of the world. Yeah, this this is this is very sad, you know. At the same time, you know, I think maybe it was, uh, you know, the way uh, the Soviet Union ended uh, was uh, too too simple. You know, it looked very, you know, nothing nothing really uh, 
bloody uh, dramatic happen, you know, except in ex-Yugoslavia, of course, but, but for the rest of the, you know, the, the ex-Soviet Union was, was sort of preserved from, from extreme forms of violence and civil war, in spite of the dismantling of a large political community, which despite all its shortcomings, you know, had also at some point some kind of universalist ideal, at least in theory, and managed, you know, as compared to the Tsarist regime before 1970, you know, managed to achieve a number of, of you know, successes in terms of uh, mass uh, education and mass uh, industrialization, very quickly ended up in, uh, you know, the authoritarian nightmares, which we all know about. And, you know, today the Russian state is... Uh, at least as it is added, you know, is, uh, is uh, you know, as, as, uh, as an imagination about the future of Russia, which is uh, tragically, uh, uh, you know, nihilistic and, uh, and, and self-defeating and, you know, very, very dangerous. Yeah, th this is part of the complex history, you know, of state building, state capacity, which can, you know, again, centralize state power, you know, can, can achieve the... the the best and the and and the worst, but you know this is not going to end up here. And I think what also we need to remember in in, in rich Western countries is that at at a general level, this is also part of what you get. You know when you believe that you know generalized uh, market competition between countries, between people, between territories is sufficient in itself, you know, to deliver a sort of universal uh, social harmony. And, you know, it doesn't work like that, you know, within Ukraine and, and within Russia, you know, you have some, some territories, some regions, in particular in the east of Ukraine, which uh, don't necessarily feel that market integration with Western Europe is going to benefit them, is going to help them to find the proper situation. So we have to you know, right now the priority is to is certainly to help uh, you know Ukraine to fight the war, but we also need to think about you know the, the more balanced economic system and a more balanced you know international uh, order, so that every country, every region, including regions within Ukraine, within Russia. You suggest democratic socialism as an arrangement that leads to greater equality. According to you, how can the democratic socialism be achieved? What, why? And is possible or not? Yes, I mean, this, not only this is possible, but we have already made a very substantial progress in this, uh, in this direction, you know, over the past uh, two centuries and, and in particular over, over the, the course of the 20th century. Despite, you know, all the catastrophes and despite all the, you know, Everything bad that happened, you know, there's been there's been a, a movement toward more uh, more equality. And you know what I put under the label of democratic socialism and participatory socialism is very much in the continuation of some of the transformations that have happened between, say, you know, if you compare the capitalism of today with the capitalism of 1910 or 1913, this really has nothing to do. You know, today we live in a, in a world where you know we have in the uh, most uh, uh, developed countries of, of Europe, you know, you have uh, a welfare state, which is, you know, 45, 50, 55% of national income. Uh, uh, we have much more equality of income and also of wealth, although it's, it has been more limited, the movement toward wealth equality as compared to 100 years ago. So there's been, you know, this achievement. Uh, we had progressive taxation, you know, the rights, the legal system defining the right of property owners uh, have nothing to do uh, today. You know, in 1910, you could fire a, a worker, reduce the wage, uh, fire a tenant uh, uh, as you want. Uh, today, you know, it's not perfect, of course, but the, the notion of, of, of what it, you know, what kind of power you have as an owner and an owner, you know, have been completely redefined. And uh, so, you know, the, I would say, you know, the, 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 the kind of participatory socialism, democratic socialism that I have in mind, of course, is, you know, it's very different from the system, you know, as compared to the system we have today. But I would say, you know, it's not more different to the system we have today than the system we have today is different from the 
kind of, uh, you know, very authoritarian, unequal, uh, patriarchal, colonial capitalism that we had in 1910. So if you look at the transformation between 1910 and, and, and 2000, uh, uh, you know, uh, 2020, you know, what, what I put under the label of participatory socialism, you know, if, if it happens by 2050 or 2080, you know, it will be in the continuation of this movement. It, so it will include much more workers' rights. So, you know, it will include, uh, you know, at least 50% of voting rights in the board of all companies, uh, small or large, for workers' representatives, just as workers, as, you know, investors in labor, independently from any shares in the capital in the company. And in addition, uh, you know, within the 50% of voting rights going to shareholders, you know, I, there will be a maximum share of voting rights that a single shareholder could have in a large company, say no more than 5% or 10% of voting rights for a single shareholder in a company with 100 workers or more, but you know, you can define different formula. In addition, there will be, you know, permanent redistribution of wealth with the minimum uh, inheritance for all that will come in addition to basic income, uh, you know, free education and health care and, you know, very extensive uh, uh, welfare state, uh, finance through progressive taxation of income, wealth and uh, carbon emissions. Uh, this, you know, this, again, this is fairly ambitious, but, you know, I think you don't need this to be adopted in every country at the same time. You know, I think this can happen, uh, uh, you know, gradually. Each individual country and region of the world can move in this direction uh, as its own pace. You know, we don't, you know, all countries don't, you don't need a world government. You don't need all countries doing everything at, you know, at the same speed. What's important for this to be possible is that, of course, you cannot at the same time move in this direction of participatory and democratic socialism and uh, take, uh, you know, free trade and free capital flows as given without any condition. So I'm, I'm, I am not against, you know, exchange of goods and services and circulation of, of, of capital and labor. Well, I am more for circulation of labor than circulation of capital. But, you know, I, I, I am not against all this form of circulation at the condition that, you know, each country can put condition to this circulation. So, you know, you need fiscal cooperation, you need social cooperation, you need environmental protection. And, and so we, it's clear that, you know, if you continue to have unconditional free trade and free capital flows without any condition, mm -hmm. then this cannot work. But this is, you know, this, but no, nobody forces us to be in such a system. And so we have to, that's, you know, that's clearly an important precondition. So we have to build, you know, a new form of sort of internationalist uh, approach to, you know, the global order and international integration where, you know, the circulation of goods and services and, and investment comes not as an objective in itself, but comes after, you know, has to come together with uh, explicit objective in terms of social justice, uh, environmental justice, fiscal justice, educational justice. And it cannot come, you know, separately as a, as a, as a you know, objective. Mark, uh, here in Prague, in the Czech Republic, we've experienced uh, so-called centralized Soviet-style common economy. And we naturally ask ourselves, why should it be this time different? Yeah, well, you know, again, so, okay, so, you know, the, the, the kind of democratic socialism and participatory socialism I have in mind has, of course, nothing to do with, you know, uh, Soviet uh, communism and state socialism, uh, like what has been experimented in Russia, in Eastern Europe, or in China uh, today. You know, it is, a, it has nothing to do because it is a much more decentralized view of political, social, economic organization. It's entirely based, of course, on pluralist uh, election, on uh, uh, workers' powers in companies, economic democracy, uh, uh, workers' rights, trade union rights. So it is inspired, you know, by the successes of, uh, 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 you know, countries like, uh, you know, social democratic regime in, uh, in, in Sweden or Germany, uh, uh, US uh, progressive taxation under Roosevelt, uh, uh, electoral pluralism in, in, in all of these countries. 
And this is trying to push further this sort of social democratic model. So if you want, you know, democratic socialism in, in my approach or, or participatory socialism is really the continuation of social democracy in the 21st century, but much more ambitious, much more demanding, but it is in the continuation. So I will say, you know, the social democratic model of today is already very different from capitalist model of 1910 and democratic socialism, you know, is sort of the next step 50 years later or 100 years later. So, you know, I think it's important to think about the long run and not just to be thinking about the next election and the next week and the next year, because, you know, of course, what I'm describing is not going to happen next week. So then you have to define steps and you have to, you know, to have political strategy to see, you know, what's possible within a given country, within a given time frame. But if you don't know where you want to go in the long run, you know, you're not going to go anywhere, even in the, in the short run. So I think it's important to reopen this discussion, to recognize, of course, the, the gigantic failures of state socialism, Soviet socialism. And, you know, for me, this was very important in my own personal trajectory and, and intellectual evolution. But at the same time, to recognize the successes of, of social democratic regime in Sweden, in, in, in the Roosevelt, in Germany, in France, in, in you know, all sorts of countries. In India, there are all sorts of things to, to learn about anti-discrimination policy in, uh, in uh, you know, the, the, the democratic parliamentary system of India. You will see something in, in Europe. Sometimes people feel they have nothing to learn from this, but I think, in fact, they have something to learn. Uh, also, there are lots of problems as well. Uh, and, you know, I think this is also part of the coming ideological competition with uh, with the system of sort of state socialism in China, which to me is, is a completely complete opposite extreme to the kind of decentralized participatory socialist models that I am describing. But I think this is a proper response to the Chinese challenge, because if the Western countries, if all they have to propose is a sort of hyper-capitalist, uh, uh, selfish system to the world, you know, I think they will actually be in a relatively weak position in the future and in the coming decades uh, in the in the global uh, ideological competition with China and 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 also with uh, with Russia uh, for that matter. Because you know the lessons about uh, social justice and democracy that Western countries are constantly giving to the rest of the world, you know, are, are sometimes very difficult to hear. Uh, from uh, from the point of view of someone in uh, West Africa or in India or in, or in Brazil, so I think you know Western countries have to be modest. They have to push, you know, their social achievement as their main assets, but they have to be modest about their you know their perfect uh, democratic model, etc. Which, as I said, is still very imperfect. They have to improve it at the same time as they propose a more equitable uh, economic model, a tax regime. To, uh, uh, to countries in the South. And at the same time, as they confront, you know, the, the legacy of, of their own, you know, the way they became rich through colonialism, through slavery, and through environmental pollution. Because of course, you know, the accumulated uh, carbon emission of countries uh, in the North, uh, you know, represent the vast majority of the historical carbon emission. And the countries in the South, typically India, you know, uh, 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 you know, uh, 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 countries in sub-Saharan Africa are going to pay the higher cost for this. And so, you know, if all the Western countries do is to, to give lessons about, uh, about democracy and justice uh, to the rest of the world, you know, I think uh, they will not uh, manage to convince anyone. And, you know, that's part of the reason why today, you know, many of these countries in the South are actually not supporting the West in the, in the Ukraine uh, war uh, with respect to, to Russia. So defining another development model and another model of democratic socialism pursuing the achievement of social democracy in 20th century Europe and to a lesser extent North America is also very important for this uh, geopolitical uh, uh, reason. May I ask one small last question? Which country is nearest to democratic socialism? You know, we always think of, of, you know, Sweden and Nordic Europe, and, and indeed, there is a lot to learn from these countries. But at the same time, you know, I should say, 
you know, there's a lot to learn from many different countries. And, you know, we have to be, we don't, we work, you know, our main enemy is nationalism, intellectual nationalism or nationalism of all sorts. So we have to learn from everybody. You know, there are problems also with Nordic countries, uh, including the fact that uh, in the past two or three decades, you know, they have played the game of uh, tax competition. Uh, yeah, they've not been, been very constructive about proposing some uh, uh, you know, cooperation and, and global cooperation to change the international uh, tax system. You know, they are, they are a bit, uh, you know, they are, they are very much centered on their own uh, sort of nation state, but, you know, I think they are not sufficiently uh, internationalist in a way. So there, there are, you know, strong limitations also, uh, also there. So we have to be, you know, very open and, uh, uh, you know, looking at how large uh, federation work, you know, for instance, you know, I think we have to, you know, the European Union has to learn by looking at how the Indian federation uh, is working, you know, that's a little country with 1.3 billion uh, people and they manage to adopt uh, uh, a common federal uh, income tax, federal corporate tax, you know, even the, you know, the, the African Union or the West African Economic Union for that matter has rules about uh, uh, how to prevent tax competition. You know, they cannot have a corporate tax rate below 25%, you know, in West Africa in order to limit tax competition, which in, in the European Union, we are not even able to, to impose to, to Ireland and Luxembourg. So, you know, I think the, the issue of democratic federalism and, and democratic socialism, you know, is an issue where we have to learn from different parts of the world and uh, there's not, one single model to, to, to follow. Mr. Piketty, thank you very much for your time. Thank you.